Previously in Surah Yunus, Allah Azza wa Jal reminded us that this world and everything in it, this life and its trials and the triumphs, none of it will last. It is like the rain which falls and causes everything to bloom and ripen with beautiful colors and sweet scents. Yet before you have time to really enjoy it, Allah's decree is laid down and everything is gone as if it had never existed at all. That's the life of this world. That's enjoyment in this world, the fun things that we are allowed, but the afterlife is completely different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says next, Wallahu yad'u ila dar salam wa yahdi ma yasha'u ila siratin mustaqim. And Allah invites to the home of peace, and He guides whom He wills to a straight path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays out for us a stark contrast between this life and the next. In this life, every moment of enjoyment, every moment of beauty and pleasure is fleeting. We work so hard, we toil away, we sacrifice so that we can have a moment's rest, a few hours of leisure a weekend, a vacation, and before we know it, we're back to work. In this world, enjoyment does not last, but the afterlife is different. Allah calls us to Dar as Salaam, the home of peace, from the Arabic root seen, Lam, Meem, which means not just peace, but wholeness and completeness. Allah Azza wa Jal is calling us to it, the home of complete peace, the home of wholeness. Because any peace that you have here, just like your leisure, just like your fun, guess what? It's not going to last. You pay the rent and you breathe a sigh of relief, but next month is going to come around and maybe your job isn't so stable. You're healthy now, you have peace, but how long until you get sick once again, or injured? Your relationships are all smooth sailing for now, but how long until there's an argument? How long until a misunderstanding or a conflict? Peace here does not last. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls to the, the home of complete peace. When the trumpet is blown and you are resurrected and you stand before your Creator and you say with sincerity that I believed and I tried my best and you follow the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, through the gates of paradise, then you will understand peace. No more sickness. No more heartache, no more rent, no more bills, no more sadness, no more fear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون. They will experience neither fear nor sadness. And Allah says, لا يسمعون فيها لغوة ولا تأثيما. In paradise, they will not hear foul speech, not even a single word, nor sin. They will only hear it said, peace, peace. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَا زَعْلَ مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهِمُ الْأَنْهَارِ وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي هَدَانَا لِهَذَا وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَا and we will remove whatever is in their hearts of resentment while flowing beneath them are rivers. And they will say, praise be to Allah who has guided us to this. We could never have been guided to this if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had never guided us. Complete, perfect peace. 
inside and out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will even remove the resentment and the hurt from our hearts. How do we get there? What's the path to this completeness, to wholeness, to peace? Allah said it in the verse, وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَى سِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ It's the straight path, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained in Surah Al-Fatiha, the path of the prophets. The same straight path that Allah has been calling us to from the time of Adam alayhi salam. And that is the path of Tawheed. You can't feel peace if you think other powers are going to save you. You can't feel peace if you don't trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan for you. You can't feel peace if you don't realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you and hears you and loves you perfectly. Like the Prophet وسلم, told Ibn Abbas, إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ When you ask, ask Allah. When you seek protection, seek protection from Allah and realize, he continued وسلم, that if the entire nation were to gather together to help you, they could not help you with anything that wasn't already decreed by Allah. And if they were to gather together to harm you in any way, they couldn't harm you with anything that wasn't already decreed by Allah subhanahu. That's the way to the home of perfect peace, Dar es Salaam. And the special thing about this path is that it does not only affect your afterlife, which is our priority, yes, and it's our main goal, but it will affect your life here on earth as well. If there's any such thing as peace on earth, it's not found in your external circumstances. It's not found in your bank balance. It's found in your internal submission to Allah. How many people do we know, either personally or through the news, who have every luxury on earth and yet they are miserable? and stressed. Money cannot buy you a satisfied mind, but Allah calls you to the home of perfect peace. And He asks you to follow in this world the path of guidance and internal peace. Part of that path to peace in this life and the next is dhikr. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and constantly bringing your thoughts back to Him. Allah says, Those who have believed and whose hearts are made tranquil by the remembrance of Allah. Unquestionably by the remembrance of Allah, hearts are made tranquil. In explaining how to apply this verse, the Salaf gave several examples. Mujahid and Qatada said, remembering Allah with the Qur'an. Sufyan ibn Uyayna said, remembering Allah by following His instructions. Muqatil said, remembering Allah by remembering His promise of paradise. All of these things and more fall under the category of dhikr. Remembering Allah and constantly bringing your thoughts back to Him. It sounds quaint. In reality, it's profound. It sounds easy. In fact, it's one of the most difficult things to do. And that's what makes it so important to our peace in the afterlife and here on earth. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَلَّا أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِخَيْرِ أَعْمَالِكُمْ وَأَزْكَاهَا عِنْدَ مَلِيكِكُمْ وَأَرْفَعِهَا بِدَرَجَاتِكُمْ وَخَيْرَ لَكُمْ مِنْ إِنْفَاقِ الذَّهَبِ وَالْوَرِقِ وَخَيْرَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْ تَلْقَوْ عَدُوَّكُمْ فَتَضْرِبُوا أَعْنَاقَهُمْ وَيَضْرِبُوا أَعْنَاقَكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَى قَالَ ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ رَوَاهُ تِرْمِذِي Should I tell you what action is the best? 
What action is the purest according to Allah and the most effective in raising your status? Even better than spending gold or silver? Even better than fighting and dying to defend your faith? Those around him said, yeah, of course, tell us. The Prophet wasallam said, Dhikrullah, remembering Allah. All of the actions the Prophet ﷺ mentioned are nothing if they aren't done sincerely for Allah. Anyone can give money to charity. Anyone can go to the battlefield and kill or be killed. But what will stop someone from doing it with pride? What will stop someone from doing it for their own reputation? Or for their own material advantage? Remembering Allah. Dhikr keeps everything that you do pure. It keeps you on track. It gives you the right perspective and the right priorities. And it gives you peace. The Prophet said, when a group of people gather in one of Allah's houses to recite Allah's book and study it together, peace and tranquility descend upon them. They are enveloped in mercy. The angels cover them with their wings and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them to those who are with Him. Remembering Allah is peace. The Qur'an is peace. Even our ritual prayer, the salah, is peace. The Prophet wasallam used to say to Bilal, when it was time to begin the prayer, Arihna bis salah, ya Bilal. Give us rest with the prayer, Bilal. Tawheed, dhikr, Qur'an, prayers. This is sirat al-mustaqeem. This is the straight path, the path of the prophets. This is the path that leads to peace. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله على إحسانه والشكر له لا توفيقه وامتنانه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأحده لا شريك له تعظيما لشأنه وأشهد أن نبينا وسيدنا محمد عبده رسول الداعي إلى رضوانه صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وإخوانه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Next Allah سبحانه وتعالى says للذين أحسنوا الحسن وزيادة ولا يرحق وجوهه مقطر ولا ذلة أولئك أصحاب الجنة هم فيها خالدون. For them who have done good deeds is the best and extra. No darkness will cover their faces, nor humiliation. Those are the companions of paradise. They will abide therein forever. Imam al-Tabari and Ibn Kathir. Mentioned in their works of tafsir, multiple hadith. Some collected by Imam Muslim, others collected by Imam Ahmed and Nasa'i. In addition to others, that the Prophet ﷺ explained this verse, saying that Al-Husna, the best, means Jannah, or Paradise. And Ziyada, or Extra, is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise. Al-Qurtubi said in his tafsir, this is the interpretation of Abu Bakr and Ali and Hudayfa and Ibn Abbas and Ubadat ibn Samat and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and Suhaib. And it is the correct interpretation. Those admitted to paradise will see their Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the afterlife, just like the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in an authentic hadith agreed upon by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. 
حديث أبي هريرة وأبي سعيد رضي الله عنهما إنكم سترون ربكم كما ترون القمر ليلة البدر وكما ترون الشمس صحوا ليس دونها سحابة ولا تضامون في رؤيته متفق عليه Certainly you will see your sustainer just as you see the moon when it's full or like the sun when there are no clouds you will have no trouble seeing him at all Finally, the true empirical certainty that the skeptics have always demanded will exist, but it will only be for the people of paradise, the people who believed in this world. We will finally get to see the one who has loved us, the one who provided for us, the one who forgave us and had mercy on us this entire time. And everything that we suffered will be a distant distant memory. How do we get there? Allah tells us in the verse, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ For those who do good, for those who have ihsan, for those who excel, for those who strive. We learn a few things here. First, faith is action. There's no separating the two. A hypothetical situation where there is faith but no action does not exist. Anybody can claim they have faith, but where is the action to prove it? And that means for us, practically speaking, that our faith must make a difference in our lives. If becoming more observant of your faith results in you being less patient, or less merciful, or less forgiving, or less forbearing, then I'm not sure what faith you are observing, but you're not doing it right. Your faith should increase you in grace. It should increase you in helpfulness and in thoughtfulness. Everyone should benefit from it, and everybody should notice a difference. How many generations of young Muslims have been chased away from the masjid or even from Islam itself by the harsh behavior of other Muslims? I don't know which Quran they're reading from, but the Quran that I read says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكْ فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ so by mercy from Allah, O Muhammad, you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude, or if you had been harsh, they would have abandoned you. So pardon them and ask forgiveness from them. If the best generation, the companions, would have fled from the best of mankind, the Prophet wasallam, if he had been harsh, then what about us? If we are rude and harsh, no one would stick around. The Quran that I read says, Muhammadun Rasulullah, Walladina ma'ahu ashidda'u ala al kuffari, ruhama'u baynahu. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are forceful against the deniers, merciful among themselves. That's the first lesson. Faith is action. The second lesson is that when it comes to action, quality is much more important than quantity. Allah Azza wa Jal says at the beginning of Surah Al-Mulk, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبَدُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا He who created death and life to test as to which of you was best in deed, not most in deed. The companions were concerned about making their actions more sincere. They were not concerned about making them more numerous. One of the early pious scholars, Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, rahimahullah, used to wake up long before Fajr, every night to recite the Qur'an and pray. But every morning, when it was almost time for Fajr, he would take his candle and blow it out. Then he would take his covers and hide underneath his covers until someone from his household came to wake him up. 
for Fajr. This is the extent that he would go to so that his worship was a secret between him and Allah. Completely secret with no temptation to show off, not even in front of his own household. Ihsan is what we're going for. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described Ihsan as أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ Worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal as if you see Him. And if you can't reach that level, then at least worshipping Him, knowing that He sees you. al jazaa min jins al amal the result corresponds to the action. Worship Allah subhanahu like you see Him in this life, and you will get to see Him in the next. <laughs>